so happy we alive. Drug overdose is a function of prohibition. And how many drug busts are we going to see on television where quarter of a million dollars worth of stolen goods were received at the, at the drug house? Well, that quarter of a million dollars of stolen goods is your and my homes, of which somebody's being, probably being broken into right now as we're having this conference in the name of drugs and being able to pay for drugs. Significant, uh, sig significant things that have happened lately, I think, with regard to the war on drugs. The movie Traffic came out. I thought that the movie Traffic did a great job of depicting the futility of the, of the war on drugs. If there's a criticism I have of the movie, why didn't they give just one minute to letting the whole country and world know that there are alternatives to what we're doing? That it isn't as futile as it sounds. If you saw recently, Vicente Fox, the president of Mexico, came out and said that we need to entertain legalization as a way to deal with drug problems. And very significant, the governor of Chihuahua, uh, Patricio Martinez, who is our neighbor to the south, border state, New Mexico, Chihuahua, Patricio Martinez three weeks ago came out and said, we need to look at drug legalization, that it is a viable alternative to what we're currently doing, that we have to control this stuff. We need to regulate this stuff. We need to tax this stuff. We need to get this product out from under the underworld and get control of it. It was very, very significant. The current drug strategy in this country, current drug strategy is reducing use. And that is a flawed strategy. And just for a minute, look, if we read in today's Washington Post, alcohol use is up in the United States by 2.5% over the last year, what would you think? Who cares? <laughs> we understand that alcohol use is cyclical. All right, it's, it's up and down. But what we care about is we care about is DWI up or down? Is the health consequence of doing alcohol up or down? Is violent crime, domestic violence associated with alcohol, is that up or down? What we're concerned about are the consequences of alcohol use, not necessarily alcohol use. Why can't we apply those same principles when it comes to drug use? Why can't we look to reduce death? Why can't we look to reduce disease? Why can't we have less drug-related crime. So in New Mexico, uh, we had uh, 12 bills, actually, that were drug-related. And my promise to New Mexicans was, you pass these 12 bills, and I guarantee you, violent crime will decrease, property crime will decrease, overdose, hepatitis C, HIV. <coughs> There'll be fewer nonviolent criminals behind bars. We will spend more money on education. We will spend more money on treatment in the state of New Mexico if you pass these 12 bills. Some of them did pass. And I thought it was significant that of all these 12 bills, none of them died. They all were advancing. None of them had died. None of them had gone to their death as a result of a vote. But we did pass a few bills. One was to allow drug felons, convicted drug felons, to work at racetracks. Another was to offer an alternative that with 18 months left to go on a, on a nonviolent drug offense that you would be allowed treatment as an option with the 18 months that you were left. Another one was to restore voting rights uh, to felons. Another... <laughs> another one was to allow, to limit liability of law enforcement administering anti-opiates. Um, I'm talking about the ability of law enforcement to be able to inject Narcan into a, an overdose victim. Narcan is a wonder drug, costs about a buck and a half, and apparently somebody can be dead on the floor, you can inject them with Narcan, and they're alive. The other day I was talking to a group. Somebody raised their hand. They said, Holland is not like the United States. The police are your friends in Holland. <laughs> the police are your friends. The police are your friends here. It's a fact. They are. But the police have taken it on the chin 
because they're the ones that get stuck with enforcing the laws that we have. So back to Narcan, all right? Back to Narcan. Here's a bill where law enforcement in New Mexico, state police, local law enforcement, they're going to get instruction on how to administer this anti-overdose drug. In their minds, right off the bat, oh yeah, we're supposed to save lives. So when they show up on an overdose scene, the first thing they're going to look to do is save a life. That's the first thing they're going to look to do, rather than to put cuffs on anybody that's running around. That's the first thing they're going to look to do. And then over a period of time, the using community is going to recognize that the police are there to save your lives. So these little strategies, these little steps can change attitudes and they can make a big difference long term. We also passed a law in New Mexico that will allow the sale of syringes in uh, pharmacies, uh, which does not promote the use of intravenous drug use, but it has a huge positive impact on health, on the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. Also, we passed a treatment bill in New Mexico that will allow us to spend $10 million more in New Mexico, which is about a 33% increase on the amount of money that we spend on treatment. Bills that didn't make it through and yet were still alive were the decriminalization of marijuana, the real decriminalization of marijuana, no arrest, fine only, medical marijuana. Arguably, we were just a few minutes from being the first legislature in the country to pass medical marijuana. Uh, habitual sentencing reform, uh, changing it to shall serve 18 months in jail, to may serve 18 months in jail, giving judges flexibility where they don't have it now, civil asset forfeiture, uh, controlled substance reform, which again would have mandated treatment rather than incarceration for selling small amounts of drugs. Um, I say just say no when it comes to drugs, and I, and I don't mean N-O, I mean K-N-O-W. And whether you agree or disagree with anything I've said here today, I'm going to end this by, by uh, listing for you Johnson's Seven Principles of Good Government, which uh, have, um, have seen me through my term as governor. One is become reality-driven, find out what's what, and base your decisions and actions on that. Number two, always be honest and tell the truth. It's extremely difficult to do damage to somebody who's willing to tell the truth regardless of the consequences. Number three, always do what's right and fair. Remember, the more you actually accomplish, the louder your critics become. Tell the truth, continue to do what you think is right. Number four is determine your goal, develop a plan to reach that goal, and then act. Don't procrastinate. Number five, make sure everybody who ought to know what you're doing knows what you're doing. Communicate. Number six, don't hesitate to deliver bad news. It's always time to fix things. Henry Kissinger said, anything that can be revealed eventually should be revealed immediately. <laughs> so point out your mistakes. Point out your mistakes as soon as possible. Always time to fix things. And then the last one is do whatever it takes to get your job done. If you don't have a job you love enough to do what it takes, then quit, because life is way too short. Get a job you love. Enjoy getting up in the morning. And with that, I would love to entertain any questions or comments or insults that you might have. <laughs> Thank you. We have about 10 or 12 minutes that we'd like to ask the audience if they could just to listen and, and allow the news media who have been covering the speech to ask some questions of the governor. And before anybody, before any of the news media asks the question, news media has a difficult job reporting this issue. This is not a sound bite issue. It really is difficult. I, I think from what I've seen, they've done a great job. Of, of trying to take it on, but it's a, it's a difficult one to communicate in a very short amount of time. Here we go, right here. 